Amen. In Matthew chapter 8, if you would please, find verse number 10. Matthew chapter 8, verse number 10. The Bible reads, When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Now this was said to the Roman centurion that came up and asked for a miracle. He had great faith that Jesus just by speaking words could heal him. We know the Jews often sought for a sign. So he says, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel, verse 11, and I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What a statement that Jesus is warning those that were in Israel practicing Judaism at the time. He's saying, if you reject me, then you will be cast out of the kingdom. We live in such a time today where with uh, modern Christianity, there are many that claim to be Christian or claim to belong to Christ, yet they preach a false gospel. They believe in their own works. They believe in doctrine that does not come from the Bible, that did not come from God. I want to talk this morning a little bit about who are God's chosen people, but specifically about Zionism. And I'd like to, I've got a handout. Uh, Brother Justice, if I could get your help. I have a handout. And I specifically want to talk about three distinct areas. It's Semitism, Judaism, and Zionism. And these are three distinct groups of ethnicity, religion, and politics. It was just this week I heard a guy say, Zionism, I've never heard that word before. I just learned the word. And he's telling me what he read on Fox News about what Zionism is, how it's a political movement. Um, and I want to just talk with it a little bit this morning. I want to show you some neat things from the Scriptures. And also want to give you some biblical definition and also a definition, a worldly definition, secular Webster's, if you will. Um, Semitism, Judaism and Zionism. These are all three very uh, encapsulated groups and they're not all exactly the same. But sometimes we hear a label and we think one equals the other, but these three do not always equal the same thing. Uh, on that first page there, you see where it starts with the title, that little, um, uh, not a diamond, triangle there. Below it it says Semitism. Now this is from Webster's. Semitism, first, is Semitic character or quali qualities. Second, is a predisposition favorable to Jews. Now, Semitism is a prejudice toward or a preference for descendants of Shem. Now, the descendants of Shem, here's an example of some, the Hebrews, Persians, Arabs, Turks, Armenians, and others. Now, listen, it is racist to prefer one race over another. If I said all the Turks are better, Turkism, right? Well, Semitism is a real problem. It's much like reverse racism in a sense, um, something that was a problem in America where they were trying to give preferential treatment to certain people based on their lineage or heritage. Now, God's not a respecter of persons. If you notice the statement here, both Semitism and anti-Semitism are forms of racism and are forbidden by the Bible. Acts 10.34, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Acts 7.26, and hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. If you say, my heritage is Africa, my lineage is China, I'm from England, I'm from Germany, I'm from France, I would say we all share the same blood, and racism is not allowed by the Bible. God absolutely forbids it. Uh, being anti-Semite, uh, in other words, hating those that were born in the Middle East or of the sons of Shem is a sin, but also being having Semitism as in preferential treatment. Uh, if you rewind in history a little bit, there was Arianism. Arianism, where they said the Arians are the super race and we're better than everybody and we're up here and 
they're just cattle and we're like gods, we're superhumans and they're just cattle that need to be destroyed. That's a very racist attitude and it's important for Christians to be balanced on this, definitely not to be anti-Semite or also not to be pro-Semite as in favoring a Semite above anybody else in the world. We all have one blood, we all come from God, we all find salvation by faith in Jesus Christ, not our blood. Notice that next point. No one is saved by their bloodline or ethnicity. Matthew 3, 9, And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. What we just read in Matthew chapter 8, where he says he had not found so great faith in Israel. Uh, notice he says, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth." It's important to recognize, just if you had Semitic blood, that cannot get you into heaven. That does not forgive your sins. The only blood that forgives sins is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. All throughout the Old Testament, Israel, when they were a nation, they were commanded to be a missionary nation, preaching to other nations, preaching salvation and God's covenant, the blessing of that covenant. Notice in Romans 2, if you see this on your paper there. Romans 2, verse 28, he, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. We should not praise Judaism above Christianity. God looks at the heart, and he says, as he says in Deuteronomy, I believe it's in chapter 4 and 10 and 30, that we should be circumcised in our heart. We should set to our seal that God is true. There will be many that will be cast out of the kingdom, and they're called the children of the kingdom, but they're not the children of God because they fell away because of unbelief. They didn't have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is very important. Now, my next point, notice it says Judaism. Here's the Webster's Dictionary definition. A religion developed among the ancient Hebrews and characterized by belief in one transcendent God who has revealed himself to Abraham, Moses, and the Hebrew prophets in a religious life in accordance with scriptures and rabbinic tradition. If you notice in this Webster's Dictionary definition, I underline those last two phrases scriptures and rabbinic tradition. That's the tradition of the teachers, the rabbis. Those are two completely different concepts. They are in opposition one to the other. Jesus warned them that they made the law of God of no effect because of their tradition. That oral tradition was later codified into the writings that the rabbis teach today. What's interesting, notice it, it talks about uh, that this is uh, Judaism, right? And you know the first mention of the word Jew in the Bible? Does anybody know where it's at off the top of your head? First or second Kings? Second Kings chapter 16, it says that the Jews were at war with Israel. Now we know that God had 12 tribes. The 10 were separated and typically called Israel. Lower was called Judah. By the time that Jesus came, they had been dispersed Babylon had intermingled them. It was no longer a clear, distinct tribe. They didn't speak Hebrew. They spoke Aramaic, and it was called a region of Judea. Uh, the Lord's judgment had came upon them. So it's important to distinct that Israel is not always Jew. Those terms are not actually interchangeable, as we often think. Uh, notice it, my first star there for scriptures. We're talking about biblical Judaism. Say, what's biblical Judaism look like? Those that obtained salvation in the first covenant and read the Old Testament. In Acts chapter 10, verse 43, it says, To him give all the prophets witness, that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. All the Old Testament prophets prophesied of the Lord Jesus Christ to come. Once he had come, they had to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. They could not be saved by that first covenant. Look, it's underlined there. It says, There is only one way to heaven, the new covenant in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 8.13 tells us, In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. The old covenant is no longer available for salvation. You must have 
the new covenant in the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 2.23 says, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Any religion that does not acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ, they cannot say we have the Father. Jehovah's Witnesses, as an example, they deny that Jesus was God. They say that He was, you know, like the, how about Islam? They say that Jesus was a good prophet. The JWs and the Muslims will both burn in hell for their sin if they don't receive the gift of everlasting life that only comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no keeping of the law for salvation. There is no bloodline for salvation. It's by faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in Ephesians 2 eight, saved through faith. That's the best news we've ever heard. It's called the good news. It's not saved by your works. It's not saved by who your daddy was or who your mommy was. It's not saved by if you did a sacrifice or you cleaned up your life. We are saved through faith. That's good news. Notice then I deal with rabbinic Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism, the majority since the 6th century, after the codification of the Babylonian Talmud. Rabbinic Judaism has its roots in the Pharisaic school of the Second Temple Judaism. These are their words. These are not mine. The Pharisees, Rabbinic Judaism today, the teachings of the rabbis, they say, we were the Pharisees. We were the Pharisees that rejected Jesus. We did not believe He was the Messiah. We took all of our oral tradition and we wrote it down. That's what codified means. It's now been codified as in what is called the Babylonian Talmud. The Talmud teaches a mystery religion, a merging of Egyptian and Babylonian doctrine, and that's how they interpret Moses is through the Talmud. There are many wicked and perverse statements in the Talmud allowing murder of Goyim, which is anybody that's cattle without a soul. They say if you're not one of them, you have no soul. Uh, allowing molesting a child. Allow, here's a statement, and I have a book, and I, I started to bring it out and read from it, but I want to keep this short and sweet. It's called Jesus in the Talmud, written by someone that's practicing in Judaism. And he extracted all the statements. He has a whole chapter on the punishment for Jesus. And he says that Jesus is burning an excrement in hell right now. The Talmud has some very wicked and blasphemous statements. This was the oral tradition that Jesus rebuked. He said, you've ignored the laws of God by your own oral tradition. And they would have a jurist, somebody that would come and rule. He's a master, he's a rabbi. And he would say, well, I think what he really meant was this, so you can do whatever you want. It's okay to steal, and it's okay for usury, and it's okay for murder under these circumstances. That's the Talmud, a very dark book. Notice the next, Orthodox Judaism. Now, this is important. We're talking about Semitism. We talked about that. Uh, we're talking about, oh, I skipped a part on, under Semitism. Notice it says, it is not synonymous with Judaism or Zionism. It is not synonymous with Judaism or Zionism. A small minority of ethnic Semites practice religious Judaism and or support Zionism. The whole point here is you, if somebody says, hey, I come from Shem, that does not mean they practice Judaism as a religion nor do they adhere to political Zionism. These are three distinct ideas. So jumping back down under Judaism, look at Orthodox Judaism. This is an important detail. The traditionalist branch of Judaism that observes the Torah, that's the Law of Moses, most view political Zionism as a blasphemous human attempt to usurp God's role in messianic restoration. Again, these are their words, these are not my words. They literally, the Orthodox Judaism, they say political Zionism to reestablish a state is going out of God's way. We are doing something that God is not blessing. We are doing something that God did not mandate. It's very interesting. Not every Jew is a Zionist, and not every Zionist is a Jew. Uh, many of them are not Semites either. These three are completely different concepts. Now look, it says non-Semitic Judaism. The next point there. Individuals with an ethnic origin other than Shem that have adopted the religion. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting. Just two weeks ago, I met a gentleman, and we start talking. 
and he converted to Judaism. Now, he was raised Catholic, he was Irish, he rejected Catholicism, and he says, I'm pretty much an atheist or an agnostic. I met my wife, she was Jewish, she never really practiced, but then we started going to these events, and I kind of like what I saw. So I went through 12 months of Torah school, and now I've converted, now I'm a Jew. Now what's interesting about that, now that he has converted after a year of school, he can go to Israel, the nation of Israel today, or Palestine, and they will give him free land. There are settlement areas where they take land from the Palestinians and they give it to Israelites as long as they are a practicing religious Jew. So you can get free land as long as you don't believe in Jesus and you have converted to the religion of Judaism. Very fascinating, this Irish guy that was raised Catholic that doesn't believe in God at all can go to Israel and get free land that has been stolen from somebody else. This is the political scene of Zionism. We're going to get into that in a second. Uh, Khazarian Judaism, a people of Turkish origin that converted to the Jewish religion sometime in the 9th century, located in the current day Ukraine. Um, I have a friend from Ukraine, Belarus. We have a guy at work that's from Ukraine. So we talk with a lot of folks from this region. And much of their culture has been blended in from the Khazarians that were a conquering nation. And many of them will claim Judaism. And some of them switch to orthodoxy. That seems to be the majority in that region. Next is Ashkenazi Judaism. 10th century, intermingled Central Europeans that converted to Judaism in the Rhineland. What's commonly called Germany today is where they were often settlers. Many of them were from different areas of Central Europe, as far as Russia and Poland and Turkey, many different countries, and they kind of created uh, their own area. This is where we would get the, the, the uh, unique language of Yiddish. Next point, look at it with the dot down at the bottom on page one. Judaism is not synonymous with Semitism or Zionism. The majority of religious Judaism does not claim ethnic descent from Shem. Now this is important. We live in a time where even our government has passed laws and they say, if you say something against the religion of Judaism, well then you're a racist. But such is not the case. Look, I can despise the religion of Mohammedism and Islam, but that does not mean that I, I hate somebody based on their blood. Racism is evil and ungodly. God is not a racist. He doesn't rejoice in the death of the wicked. No, 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 He doesn't. And we should not either. Judaism is not synonymous with Semitism or Zionism. Um, people have called me an anti-Semite because I would preach against Judaism or the Talmud. That's a lie. If you know me, I love the world. I, want to, I love the lost. I love all the lost. I want to see the Muslims get saved and the Jews get saved. I want to see uh, the Chinese get saved and of every religion. The Buddhists, they need to get saved. The Mormons, they need to get saved. We need to love them and preach the gospel to them unbiasedly. Racism is evil in God's eyes, but the world will label you as if you're a racist if you disagree with this particular religion. Could you imagine if, if I said, well, Catholics are wrong, and somebody said, you hate the Irish. So what are you talking about? <laughs> I don't hate the Irish just because I say Catholicism is wrong. You see what I'm saying? Or you hate the Italians. These things are different. They're not the same. Written to Christians. Now, I want you to notice this at the bottom of page one. Did anybody else need a, another handout? I, do you need a handout, sister? You got one. Praise the Lord. All right. Written to Christians, bottom of page 1, 1 Peter 2, 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. 
Judaism, if you notice that last statement, must repent of unbelief in Jesus as Messiah for salvation. Christians are God's chosen people, according to 1 Peter 2, not because of our bloodline. It's not because of our zip code. Some people are confused and they say, well, if you live in Israel, you're God's people. Imagine if I said, if you live in the White House Otis area in Jacksonville, you're automatically going to heaven. You'd say, well, that's kind of bizarre. And what, show, me, show me anywhere in the Bible that would support that. We are the people of God because we have chosen God. Judaism must repent of unbelief in Jesus and their sins have already been paid for. They're already forgiven. All they have to do is receive the gift. Now on the back side with Zionism, and I'll be brief on this. Zionism, Webster's Dic Dictionary definition, it says an international movement originally for the establishment of a Jewish nation or religious community in Palestine and later for the support of modern Israel. A few of the key players in Zionism, it was started with a man named Theodor Herzl, a Hungarian journalist and political activist. He was the father, father of modern political Zionism. Herzl formed the Zionist organization and convened the first Zionist Congress in 1897. Up until the 1900s, Zionism was not a, an established thing. People didn't know what this word means. In fact, today, as I said, people still don't entirely know what it means. Uh, Eliezer, Eliezer, Eliezer Perlman was born in Russia in 1858 and his native language was Yiddish. He later changed his name to Ben Yehuda and is often regarded as the reviver of the Hebrew language. He was the first to raise the concept of reviving Hebrew. His Slavic slash Yiddish influence can be seen in the restored Hebrews movement to change the name of God from Jehovah to Yahweh. It was a different language. Hebrew was unspoken. In Jesus' time, they spoke Aramaic. Hebrew was a dead language. There is a difference between biblical Hebrew and modern revived Hebrew. It's totally different based on different vowel points, pronunciation, and a dictionary. This man wrote a dictionary, uh, this uh, Ben Yehuda, as he called himself, and then he convinced several other rabbis to begin only corresponding and speaking to each other in Hebrew this, based on this new dictionary he wrote so they could try to revive the language and teach their children to speak it. Next, you'll notice the British Balfour Declaration. In 1917, in order to win political and financial support for Britain's first World War effort, the British Balfour Declaration promised the establishment of a Zionist national home in Ottoman-controlled Palestine. This letter was addressed to Lord Rothschild, a banker and politician. The Rothschild family was a wealthy Ajik Nazi family originating from Frankfurt. The Rothschilds control many banking institutes and have historically held royal titles of nobility in several European countries, including Austria and the United Kingdom. So they're politicians, they're bankers, they are behind the majority of the banking institute as we understand it today. Even to this day, he was the second Baron Rothschild. We have the fourth that's alive. He, Baron is a royal title. He has special land and special authority, but it's not from God. Notice the point there, Zionism is not synonymous with Semitism or Judaism. Most political Zionists do not practice Judaism, nor are they descendants of Shem. And then you notice to end this section I put, Semitism does not equal Judaism, does not equal Zionism. So what have we learned thus far? Semitism is favoring the race of those that descended from Shem. We shouldn't be racist. We also should not be anti-Semite and despise them either. Uh, I pray they all get saved. We need to preach the gospel to all of them. Now, unfortunately, in the Middle East right now, in Israel, they're, they're passing a law that if you preach to somebody under 18 years old, you can get two years. If you name Jesus, if you preach the gospel to a child under 18, you can get two years in prison. It's currently one year to everybody. They're trying to add that second year for children. So you don't preach Jesus when you're in Israel. Ask anybody that's been there. How do you preach to the Muslims? You don't do that either. They'll cut your head off, right? <laughs> the Muslims aren't very friendly to the name of Jesus either. Now, uh, I have preached to rabbis. I have spoken to those. And I have tried with Muslims as well. 
Um, you could call me a dummy, but I'm hard-headed. I'm, I'm willing to try. I'm willing to try. And I think it's profitable to try and to plant the seeds. Uh, we ought to try to see everyone saved. That's why we're here. Now, I want you to notice something about the name Israel. Um, on, the, on the bottom half of this sheet, final thing, and I'll make it as brief as possible, Jesus is Israel. The name Jesus is a name for the name Israel is a name for Jesus, just like the name Emmanuel, God with us. It originates in Genesis 32, 28. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Jesus is the prince of power. He's prevailed with God. And he goes on and says, What's your name? And he wouldn't tell him. And there's this, basically that is a name of the Lord Christ to come before he came. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, we all know this verse, if my people, which are called by my name, you hear that, called by my name. Now we're Christians, we're called by the name of Christ today, now that we have the new covenant. Jews that got saved in Acts chapter 11, they became Christians, right? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal, heal their land. The name Israel is used five times in 2 Chronicles 7. That name of God is Israel. We adopt His name. We're called the sons of God. We're the children of God. Isaiah 42, Behold my servant, in whom I am uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Jesus is Israel. And if you're in Jesus, in a sense you're Israel. But I'm not talking about a political nation. I'm talking about the people of God. Saved people are surnamed Israel, if you see this point. From righteous Abel to the last living believer. In Isaiah 44, one shall say, I am the Lord's. And another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. And another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. This reminds me in John 3, says that he set to his seal that God is true. When you believe in your heart, you're swearing, if you will, you're becoming a son of God. Notice in Romans 9, 6, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. You say, what does that mean? He's going to define it for us in the next verses. Everyone that claims to be Israel of the flesh, they are not the children of God. Look what it says in uh, uh, Romans, Roman 9, verse 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Galatians 3, if this is, if this is something that you need to study out, start in Galatians. Go read Galatians 3, pray over it, meditate, fast and pray, and let the Lord show this to you. Galatians 3, verse 7, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. Now, get it, guys. The people in this church that are saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, you are the children of Abraham. You have the promise of the blessing of Abraham. It came to you. Now, obviously, that seed is Christ. Continuing in verse 8, and the Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Same chapter, verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Now wait a minute. Do you see what he says here? Did you notice elsewhere in the Bible it uses this phrase, once we're in Christ, we came out of the Gentiles, which means the nations. And he says, D don't give offense to the Gentiles. Well, I was a Gentile. What happened? Well, now I'm of a holy nation. I'm of the heavenly nation. I am a peculiar people. I'm the people of God by trusting in Christ. I've been adopted by the Lord. I'm His child now. I'm a child of God by faith. Galatians 6, look, he says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy upon the Israel of God. Galatians 6 says, if you're in Christ, you are the Israel of God. 
We are God's chosen people because we've chosen Jesus to be our Savior. Now, this doesn't give us a, a right to a land. That doesn't mean you have a certain bloodline. And our religion is definitely different than Judaism. This is not replacement theology where a Catholic doctrine that uh, um, everybody that's ever been good has automatically been adopted. Replacement theology is a straw man argument. Um, you could say that the promises have been fulfilled in Christ and were in Christ. Now think about it. Abel, the first man to die, he'll be resurrected at the same time that you're resurrected. We're all in the same family going to the same place. We're spiritually called Israel. Uh, Christians are part of heavenly Israel, not the political Israel. I say all this at this time because I know that there are some Christians advocating that we go to war in the Middle East to defend the political nation of Israel. Uh, personally, I am a libertarian. And what that means is I don't want the government's help. I would rather be responsible for myself. I'd rather keep my tax money and save up for my health care and take care of my own business. And I don't want to, I'm not the guy that comes out and say, well, the, the government needs to come and fix this. And we need a new law and the government needs to do that and take care of this. As a libertarian, I believe in personal responsibility and personal liberty. It goes hand in hand. And with that, I wish that we would stop sending money to hundreds of nations around the world. We have troops in 70 different nations around the world. And now listen, we have been sending money to Palestine and Iraq. I mean, we have supported the Taliban and Hamas and Al-Qaeda, which means the CIA database. We've been supporting the enemy for years. And we've been supporting Israel and Turkey and Jordan. It doesn't make sense. We're breaking the back of America by giving money to whom we deem the good guys. And also because the UN said so, we give them to the bad guys because we want friends everywhere. It's about to destroy our economy. It's not righteous to take our money and give it to any other nation. Frankly, politically, I would say, let Israel do whatever it wants to do, but we don't need to be over there. We have, Israel has been trying to establish its nation for some time as a political nation, which is not the spiritual that the Bible talks about. But I say, hey, if they want to be at war with Palestine, uh, both of them are losing family members on both sides, and there comes a point. Listen, if somebody came to your house and said, I'm going to shoot you if you don't leave your land, well, you have a choice. Do you want to die for your house, or would you rather keep your life? I would say move. If somebody came, I'm going to kill you and your family, I'd say, let us move. We'll go, we'll go, we'll run, we'll flee. That's what Jesus said in Luke 21. He says, the Olivet Discourse, he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, he says, flee into the mountains. He says, why? The desolation thereof is nigh. Last point, look, he says, what about the land promise? Right at the end there, he says, what about the land promise? Hebrews 11, by faith, Abraham, it says, looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham looked for heavenly Jerusalem, Mount Zion, that spiritual city which is in heaven. That's the new Jerusalem that comes down during the millennium. Uh, Hebrews 12, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. You guys, you see that church of the firstborn? If you're born again, if you're saved, you are in this church from righteous Abel to the last believer that will be on earth. We're all part of God's family. We all have a place in my father's house. There are many mansions. We resurrect at the same time. We're saved by the same faith. Verse 24, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. The only blood that matters is that of Jesus. His covenant is a better covenant, it calls it. That old covenant has gone away. Israel in the Old Testament was a symbol of what God would establish in the millennium. And what's neat is God's coming back and He's going to establish it, but today many people reference Old Testament references of the millennium, of the resurrection, and they say that's what happened in 1948. But that's misusing Scripture. I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope it helps, helps you understand because people throw around words, Judaism, Semitism, Zionism, and we don't often know what it means. Now, from a biblical perspective, I believe as Christians, we should not support any foreign nation. We should defend our own house 
And we need to preach the gospel to every race, every nation. That's our job. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. I pray that this would be a blessing. I pray that it would help us to better understand the signs of the time. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to honor you and all that we say and that we do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you're dismissed for Sunday school.